then that was then this is now by S. E. Hinton day six chapter seven I went with Kathy to break the news about M and M to her parents and to explain why we were so late her father was sitting up waiting for us, and when I saw his face, I was glad that I had a real good excuse, even though I was quite a bit bigger than him. Her mother got up and came into the front room in her house coat. She got real upset when we told her what had happened, but her father said, He'll be home tomorrow. That kid's been going through this stage for months now. It's not just a stage, Kathy cried. You can't say this is just a stage when it's important to people what they're feeling. Maybe he'll outgrow it someday, but right now, it's important. If he never comes home, it'll be your fault. I was picking on him about silly, goofy things like his hair and flunking Jim. She sat down and began to cry again. Her father just looked at her and said, Honey, I know it's because you're worried that you're talking like this. Eminem will be home tomorrow. He's a sensible kid. Then why didn't you ever tell him so? Kathy sobbed irrationally. I don't think he's coming home tomorrow. He doesn't do things on the spur of the moment. He thinks things out. He's not going to come home. By now, two or three younger kids had wandered in, dressed in their underwear, or not dressed at all. They got enough out of the conversation to gather that Eminem was gone, and they began crying, crying too. It was a big mess, and I felt really uncomfortable. Mark was waiting out in the car, and as it was two in the morning, and I had to go to school in a few hours, I wanted to leave. Only I just didn't want to leave Kathy. I wish I could take her home with me. The father said, Brian, thank you for your help. I think you'd better be going home. Your mother is probably worried. I could have told them that Mom never worried about Mark and me. She loved us, but let us run our own lives. But I only said, yes, sir. I suddenly noticed that where he wasn't bald, his hair was charcoal colored, too, and that his eyes, though smaller with age, were the same as Kathy's and Eminem. I wondered if it was strange, seeing your eyes in someone else's face. I was tired and thinking funny. Everyone uptight? asked Mark when I got back in the car. Yep, I said. I don't blame them. They don't have nothing to worry about, Mark said. Half the kids on the ribbon are living in someone else's car or house or garage. Shoot, I remember last summer you and me sometimes didn't come home for weeks. We were bumming around the lake or somebody's house. Remember when Williamson rented that apartment for a couple of months with two other guys? I bet half the kids in town stopped there overnight. Yeah, but Eminem is just a kid. So are we. Nothing bad happens to you when you're a kid. Or haven't you realized that? Youth is free from worry, I said sarcastically. You've been listening to too many adults. I don't worry. I'm never scared of nothing. I never will be, Mark said, as long as I'm a kid. You can, you can get away with anything, I said, because that phrase came through my head whenever I really thought about Mark. Yeah, I can. He was quiet. You used to be able to. I looked at him, and suddenly it was like seeing someone across a deep pit, someone you couldn't ever reach. It was like the car had widened out into the Gulf of Mexico, and I was seeing Mark through a telescope. What's happening? I said half out loud, but Mark was asleep. Eminem didn't come home the next day like his father thought he would. Kathy and I ran up and down the ribbon every night for a week, but it was, wasn't fun anymore because we were looking out for Eminem. We never did find him. We must have stopped 60 million little long-haired kids thinking they were Eminem, but none of them was. I began watching for him everywhere. I got a job in a supermarket, and I did a pretty good job of changing my attitude, outwardly at least. I couldn't help thinking smart out things, but I could help saying them. Sacking groceries wasn't the most fun job in the world, but I was bringing in money. Mark was bringing in money, too, more than an he ever had before. I couldn't imagine him stealing all of it, so I figured he must have gone in serious for poker. I never asked him where he got it, and Mom didn't either. Of course, she would never think Mark was getting it dishonestly. Besides, none of us was in any position to turn away extra money. One night, a couple of weeks after Eminem disappeared, Mark and me went goofing around by ourselves again. It was almost as if we had never felt a gulf between us, never been separated by something we couldn't see. We drove up and down the ribbon, trying to pick up chicks and get into drag races, even though our car wasn't at all wasn't all that fast. I was kind of half-hearted about picking up chicks, too, as I was more serious about Kathy than I let on, even to Kathy herself. Hey, Mark said suddenly, look at who was over there in the parking lot. It was Angela and a bunch of other chicks, her type, by the way they dressed and the way they were acting. You can always tell when a girl wants to be picked up. Let's pull in, Mark said. He was smiling. Sure, I said, feeling with the old sense of thrill that something was up, something was going to happen. We pulled into the parking lot and immediately were surrounded by girls. Out of the way, I said superiorly. I want to see Angela. Brian, she yelled and jumped for me in the minute I got out of the car. Brian, I'm so glad to see you. She was pretty drunk. I let her hug me, though, catching Mark's wink. Where have you been keeping yourself, Angel? I said. How's married life? She let go with a string of swear words, which told me pretty well what she thought of married life, her in-laws, and her husband. I never cared about him anyway. I thought I was having, I mean, I thought I was, but I wasn't. And that's the only reason I married him, the louse. 
She was half crying now, between obscenities. You're the only boy I ever cared about, Brian. Sure, I said. I still hated the sight of her. She was as beautiful as ever, so striking that she could have been a movie star, but I remembered all the trouble she had caused compared to her, compared her to Kathy and hated her. I let her hug me and ball into my shirt front because Mark was winking at me. Angel, let's go for a ride, Mark said. You and Brian can talk over old times and maybe I can get some more booze for you. Sure, Angela said, always eager for free booze. I couldn't believe she was that glad to see me. We drove around for a while, Angela telling us all of her problems. Her husband didn't have a job, her brothers were both in jail, the old man was drunk all the time, and her father-in-law was always slapping her bottom. I had always taken her family for granted. They weren't so different from the most, of, most of the families in our neighborhood. But now that I had seen Kathy's home, not rich, not much more than poor, but where everyone, everybody cared about each other and tried to act like decent people, the picture Angela was painting was making me sick. I could hardly stand for her to be hanging, hanging onto my arm. At Mark's request, I pulled into a parking lot across the street from a liquor store. Mark got out and disappeared. He was looking for somebody to buy the booze. You can't legally buy booze until you're 21 in this state, so we always have to get some old guy to buy it for us, usually somebody's big brother. If you can't come up with one of them, there was bound to be some rummy hanging, rummy hanging around who was willing to buy it if you gave him a little extra to buy something for himself. I sat in the car and talked to Angela, who had completely given up two ears. It was the first time since I had known her that I had seen her cry. She was a tough little chick. Her makeup, eye makeup was running all over my front, my shirt front, but that didn't bother me as much as the way it was running down her face in dark streaks. She almost looked as like she was behind bars. Mark hopped back into the car with some rum, and we got a carton of pop at one, a one-stop store and took off for the lake. It was too cold to go swimming, but the lake is always a good place to go. There are a mess of them, lakes, that is, around here. I get so sick, Angela was saying. I feel like I can't take it anymore. Life is so lousy. I'm lousy. Everything is lousy. I can't stand it at home. I can't stand it at school. I can't stand it anywhere. I always thought, heck, I can get what I want. Gee, what I want and everybody can go to heck. But it doesn't, or get what I want and everybody can go to heck. But it doesn't work that way, Brian. I'm going to heck right along with them. I'm already there. Tomorrow she would be tough again. Hard as rock, Angela Shepard. Tonight she was tired and drunk. She passed out of my shoulder. We were stopped on a little dirt road, one of the millions that run along the lake and through the woods surrounding it. Mark sighed. I thought she was never going to shut up. I sure hate to see gutsy chicks break. It destroys my faith in human nature. You're never going to break, huh? Nope, Mark said. He pulled a pair of scissors out of his pocket. Picked these up at the one stop. He reached over and began cutting off Angela's beautiful long blue-black hair close to her head. You ain't going to cut it all off, I said, stunned. Yeah, I am. Setting up Curtis like she did. Getting me cracked like that, she could have had me killed. That's right, I said, and suddenly all the hatred I had for had, had for Angela, her for her brother Curly, for everything she stood for, came back. I sat and watched Mark cut off all her hair. He tied it up neatly when he had finished the job. It was a couple of feet long. Even with her hair gone and her makeup streaked all over her face, Angela was a beauty. She would always be. A lot of good it did her. We drove home about three that morning. Mark and me finished what was left of the rum. We dumped Angela and her hair in the front yard. She never even woke up. I didn't think she'd remember getting into the car with us, but her girlfriends would probably tell her that. She'd know who had cut off her hair. She wouldn't do anything about it, though, because one thing I knew about old Angela, or old Angel, she was proud. She'd say she had her hair cut at the beauty shop. She'd say, I was sick of all that hot mess. She'd never let on. I started crying on the way home for, for Angela's and Mark from Angela's, and Mark had to drive. Sometimes, rum affects me like that. I was still crying when we got home. <clears throat> we sat on the porch, and I cried while Mark patted me on the back and said, Hey, take it easy, man. Everything's going to be all right. I finally quit and sat sniffing and wiping my eyes on my shirt sleeve. It was a quiet night. I was thinking. Yeah, Mark said in the same easy, concerned voice. What were you thinking, Brian? About that kid, Mike, the one in the hospital. We talked to him a couple of times, remember? Yeah, I remember. He got beat up trying to do a black chick a favor. How come things always happen like that? Seems like you let your defenses down for one second, and man, you get it. Pow. Care about somebody, give a dang for another person, and you get blasted. How come it's like that? You got me, Brian. I never thought about it. I guess because nothing bad has ever happened to me. I looked at him. Nothing bad had ever happened to him. His parents had each had killed each other in a drunken fight when he was nine years old, and he saw it all. He had been arrested for auto theft. He had seen Charlie shot and killed. He had nearly been killed himself by some punk kid he had never seen before. Nothing bad had ever happened to him? Then I knew what he meant. 
those things haven't left a mark on him because he was Mark the Lion. Mark, different from other people. Beautiful Mark, who didn't give a dang about anyone, except me. I suddenly knew why everyone liked Mark, why everyone wanted to be his friend. Who hasn't dreamed of having a pet lion to stand between you and the world? Golden, dangerous Mark. You're my best friend, Mark, I said, still a little drunk, just like a brother to me. I know, buddy, he said, patting me again. Take it easy, don't start bawling again. I sure wish I knew where Eminem was, I said, and tears were running down my face again in spite of myself. I like that dumb little kid. I wish I knew what happened to him. He's okay. Take my word for it. Do you know where he is? I said. He's been gone all these weeks, and you know where he is. Yeah, I do. If he wanted to come home, he'd co come home. Don't worry. You gotta take me to where he is, Mark, I said, knowing I sounded like a drunken nitwit. But I couldn't help it, seeing how I was so drunk. Sure, Brian, don't cry. I'll take you there tomorrow. But don't count on him coming home. Kathy's awful worried about him. You know, Mark, I think I'm gonna marry Kathy. Come on, man, Mark said, trying to pull me to my feet. Yeah, marry Kathy and be sure to name all the kids after me. Let's go in the house. Try and be quiet, okay? You don't want the old lady to see you like this. I should have known better than to let you drink all that rum. Didn't you drink any? Nah, I was drinking plain Coke. I drank all that rum myself by myself? I couldn't believe it. I'm not much of a boozer. Except for what Angela drank. Mark was helping me up the steps. I was weaving back and forth. If he hadn't been hanging on to me, to me I would have dropped flat on my face. Poor Angel. We should have left her alone, Mark. That was a mean thing to do, cut off her hair like that. Please, Brian, for Pete's sake, don't cry anymore. He half dragged me, dragged me into our room and pushed me onto my bed. I passed out. I could hear Mark moving around the room, feeling him taking my shoes off and pulling the blanket up over me. But it was all as if he was real far away, or I was way down inside myself. Where did I ever do to deserve you, Mark? Pull a thorn out of your paw? Brian, buddy? You're as wiped out as I've ever seen you. I think you'd better shut up and go to sleep. When did we start running around together, Mark? Remember? We've always been friends. I can't remember when we weren't. How come your old man shot your mother? She shot him back, but it was too late because she was dying anyway. I really was drunk because I had never mentioned that to Mark in all the years I had known him. It was me. I was under the porch. I could hear them playing. And the old man was saying, I don't care. I ain't never seen a kid with eyes that color. Nobody in my side of the family has eyes that color. Not on yours either. And the old lady says, that's right. Why should he look like anybody in your family? He ain't yours. And then they started yelling, and I hear the sound like a couple of firecrackers. And I think, well, I can go live with Brian and his old lady. Did you really think that? I opened my eyes, and the room was turning around slowly. It was making me sick. Something was making me sick. Yeah, I did. I didn't like living at home. I got sick of them yelling and fighting all the time. I got whipped a lot, too. I remember thinking, this will save me the trouble of shooting them myself. I don't like anybody hurting me. I'm glad you came to live with us. Me too. Now you really better shut up, man. Why are you trying to shut me up? I said, making an effort to sit up. It made me even sicker, so I lay back down. You got a cigarette? Right in the old secret place, Mark pulled back his mattress and got a pack of cigarettes. He always kept an extra pack there. When we were little and didn't want Mom to know we smoked, we kept our cigarettes hidden. It wasn't until much later that we found out that she had known about it all along. I couldn't light my cigarette for some reason. Mark lit it for me and stuck it in my mouth. He sat back on his bed watching me, his elbows on the windowsill. I could see the end of his cigarette glowing. Charlie, he tried to help somebody out, and look what happened to him, I said. This was connected with what he'd said about Mike somehow, but Mark followed my train of thought, just like he always had. Charlie wasn't about to let a couple of his friends get beat up by home hicks, by some hicks. What happened then? Well, that was just the way things turn out sometimes. Yeah, but listen, Mark, if somebody had said, to him, is saving a couple of dumb kids from getting beat up worth your life? He would have said, heck no. Charlie would have said that, Mark. Sure he would have said that. But you don't know what's coming. Nobody know it does. He sure knew he was taking a chance. Brian, he must have known those guys had guns. He knew they were rough guys. He took a chance, and you got a rod and break. That's it. It doesn't make any sense. Like you getting busted with that bottle. A little harder, and you would have, would have been dead. But I ain't. This is the way it is, Brian. Angela Shepard is a tough little chick who set out to get a shy guy who didn't know she was alive. So she sweet talked some dummy into fighting for her. And I happened to be friends with Curtis. Happened to be sitting on the car with him when the dummy picks the fight with him. And I happened to be a little high. So I step in between Curtis and the punk. Now if Angela wasn't tough, if she was a nice girl from the west side, maybe she would have le left well enough alone and given up on Curtis. If Curtis was a playboy like you, he would have picked her up 
when she started to be when, when she wanted to be picked up. If that kid wasn't so dumb, he would have never taken on Curtis, who is no slouch of a fighter, man, I can tell you. If I had had a date that night, I would have been somewhere else. But Brian, that ain't the way things that went. You can't walk through your whole life saying if. You can't keep trying to figure out why things happen, man. That's what old people do. That's when you can't get away with things anymore. You gotta just take things as they come and quit trying to reason them out. Brian, you never used to wonder about things. Man, I've been getting worried about you. You start wondering why and you get old. Lately, I felt like you were leaving me, man. You used to have all the answers. I can't help them, Mark. I can't help thinking about things like Mike and Charlie and Eminem and you. It's all mixed up. I can't help it. You can help thinking about it. He leaned over his bed and reached across the short space that separated us and yanked my cigarette out of my fingers. You're going to go to sleep and burn us alive. He said, I remember I was going to say, no, I ain't. But I was asleep before I could get the words out. Chapter 8. I was real hungover the next morning. Besides that, I had to get up early and go to work. Mark woke me up. He was a human alarm clock. It never needed more than five hours of sleep a night. Me, if I don't get at least nine hours, I feel dead. I felt dead that Saturday morning. I wished I was anyway. I was feeling so bad that I had actually stuck a loaf of bread in a grocery bag and dropped three cans of soup on top of it. Bread always goes on top. In the supermarket, this is like the Ten Commandments, all rolled into one. It was a wonder I didn't lose my job that Saturday. I carried groceries for this one young housewife type. And when I put the bags in her car, she handed me her phone number. I was feeling so bad I groaned. Lady, you gotta be kidding. Like I said, it was a wonder I didn't lose my job. It was two in the afternoon before the sound of the cash register quit blasting my ears and it was quitting time before I finally felt I could eat something. This shows how sick I was. I had a date with Kathy that night, but she had to work late. I would pick her up at the hospital snack shop at 10. This was fine with me as I wanted a chance to go look for Eminem. Mark knew where he was. When I got off work, I found Mark sitting in my car. Figured you want to hunt for Eminem, he said. How's your head? Better. Man, don't ever let me guzzle like that again. Mark shrugged. You wanted to. You had to get good and drunk because I was cutting Angela's hair off and you couldn't take it. I flipped a remark that I had said many times before, but not to him. Even from my side of the car, I felt him tighten, getting ready to spring. The gulf, was, the gulf was between us again. For some reason, I was hacked off because he didn't need to sleep nine hours because he wasn't hungover. You sound like Kathy, I said. Heaven forbid. What have you got against her anyway? What's she got against me? You're a bad influence. I don't know why I said that, because Kathy sure as heck never said anything like it. Mark was quiet for a minute. Then he said something really rotten. I had it coming for what I'd said to him. I didn't, didn't have to drag Kathy into it. I gripped the steering wheel. Want to get out of this car and have it out? You don't want to swing on me, do you? It was a partly a statement and partly a request. I was quiet. I'm sorry, Mark said, and I kept driving. This was as close as we ever came to having a fight.